Okay, so today we're going to be talking about dragons. A couple of weeks ago, I put out a, a video about mermaids where we kind of dug into the origins of the mermaid myth and a lot, a lot about that. And I had a lot of fun doing that video, so I'm just gonna keep doing them. So this week we're talking about dragons. So I've spent a lot of time trying to research these creatures, where the myth comes from, the different, the many, many, many different versions of dragons across the world's mythology and uh, how it's kind of seeped so deeply into our culture. It's been fun and also infuriating to research. So now I'm going to try to heavily condense that information and present it to you. Dragons are a myth that have seeped so deeply into our cultures that it doesn't matter which continent, which country, which culture you go to, they have in their own mythology a version of dragons. And what's cool is how extremely they differ from region to region. From living in dark, damp caves on the earth to flying in the sky or ruling the sea, there are so many different versions of dragons that kind of just take over every space they live in in their myth. Depending on what kind of dragon you research, they have such different shapes and forms and personalities from brutal and cruel that must be slain to elegant and wise. Some dragons breathe fire and some don't. Some control the seas. Some have wings and can fly and some slither like serpents. Some have many horns, some have few, some have none, and they can have any number of heads. Dragons in different cultures take so many different forms and shapes. They vary in such great ways, but something that it seems that they all have in common is that dragons are great and imposing and powerful. They're a form that's familiar to us in their reptilian way, whether they look like a large lizard or like a giant snake. Sometimes they're kind of a compilation of multiple animals like lions or stags or crocodiles. They're these imposing, powerful forces that depending on which kind of dragon you're looking at, either is this great foe that must be slain or this incredible deity that we need to learn from and respect. What's crazy is that these myths go back so far that we can't actually know their origin or how far back it is. We have texts that we don't even actually know when they were written where dragons are mentioned. We have the Epic of Gilgamesh, which we don't know when it was written, but probably sometime before 1400 BC, where, a, where Gilgamesh slayed a dragon. In Apollonius of Rhodes, which was written sometime in the third century BC, but probably one that a lot of people are aware of that's not quite as old as these that I just referenced, but that was written in the Middle Ages, is Beowulf. That was written somewhere between the 8th and the 11th century, probably, where an unnamed dragon is slain by the combined efforts of Wiglaf and Beowulf. Most of the earliest mentions of dragons were really vague and brief. The description of the dragon in Beowulf was the most vivid description we got up to that point, and it largely shaped what dragons would look like in fiction going forward. Dragons continued to appear in literature and fiction for years to come, but some of the most notable works were in some of the later Wizard of Oz books, in a bunch of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien stories, some of the most notable fantasy writers ever. And through the generations, it seems that writers have been inspired by the way dragons have been written in generations before them, have taken those and changed them little by little over time. Like in The Wizard of Earthsea, the portrayal of dragons began looking very similar to smog. They grow in stature and nobility. They become virtual demigods who speak the language of creation as their mother tongue. Or later, The Dragon Riders of Pern, which I believe is the first book to create a mental link between dragons and their writers. But that's what's so amazing about this myth is that while you can't trace its origins, you can see a th clear thread of authors taking inspiration from the books before them and how it's really shifted and changed through years and years of literature. But there's so many ancient texts, religious texts, and poems where dragons were mentioned briefly but factually 
all throughout history dating back farther than we can possibly trace. But all over the world, in countless countries and cultures and people groups, the myth of the dragon goes so far back that it's impossible for us to trace. There's Vitra, which was a spirit that seeks power and dominance and was the main adversary of the king of the demigods. Boitata in Brazil was born in a time of darkness with worldwide flooding that killed many people and animals. So this anaconda could shine in the darkness and when the serpent died, it burst into light and escaped the sun. But if you see eyes in the darkness even now, make sure not to look into them because that's Boitata and it could drive you insane. Picamba is a shapeshifter, can take on 364 different shapes, including a human. He's the great dragon lord, the ruler and protector of earth and destroyer of evil. Bakunawa is the serpent of the Philippines. Once there were seven moons, but they were so beautiful that Bakunawa leapt from the sea and ate one whole. But the the moon dissolved in Bakunawa's stomach, so he leapt up and ate another, and another. Finally, he was prevented from eating the last. Quetzalcoatl was a patron of arts and knowledge, inventor of the calendar, and he journeyed to the underworld and faced off the god of the underworld who was guarding humanity's bones. He was able to steal the bones, bring them up, and shed his own blood over them. And that was how he brought humanity to life. Long is a dragon that is an ancient symbol of power, strength, prosperity, and good luck. Chinese dragons control water and weather and can bring storms and floods. They rule over moving bodies of water, like waterfalls, rivers, and seas, and so many more. This has been one of my favorite parts of researching this video, is seeing how many different types of dragons are all over history and culture and all the many forms they take. It's so interesting that dragons really don't have much of a template other than imposing and powerful, but other than that, they can take the form, they can take the shape, the appearance of so many different types of animals. They can have different abilities. Even the dragon's personalities and purposes that they serve and ways in which they affect people and cultures vary so greatly across different cultures and myths. And it's so cool to see some of them are awesome. Some of these myths, some of the ways that dragons affect the, the world around them is so cool. So why dragons? Why even way back when communication amongst different cultures was non-existent? Why did this myth live in every corner of the earth? Well, we have some theories and like everything in history, historians disagree and really we don't know that much. Some people believe that the reason the myth of dragons is everywhere and so prominent in all cultures is because of this innate fear that we have of snakes. There's actually studies that have shown that a fear of snakes is something, I don't know why I put that in quotes, a fear of snakes is something that is actually ingrained in our very being. It's not something that we control, but it's, some, it's a part of our brain that naturally activates. And that while yes, there are people that are not afraid of snakes, the majority of people do have some sort of natural instinctual ugh, when they see a snake. Even if they know that it's been domesticated it's, uh, in some way, my cousin had a pet snake growing up and I held that snake because I wanted to be cool, but I was scared. We just have this innate fear within us, or rather the majority of people have an innate fear of an innate uncomfortableness with snakes that's just kind of built into our brains. So some people think that the reason dragons are so prominent is because there is this fascination, this fear, this, this uh, something that's, that's natural in in most humans brains and so a mythology about a creature that is snake-like in a lot of cultures just kind of happened seems a little bit of a stretch but sure why not some historians believe that fossils are what caused this myth to appear everywhere. We know absolutely that dinosaurs existed. So it's possible that early on in history, people have found fossils and just kind of imagined what these giant reptilian creatures must have looked like and created dragons. And there are historians that believe that dragons actually existed, that they were a part of the dinosaur family and people saw these dinosaurs 
and 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 created them as part of their myth but they picked out different dinosaurs and that's why we don't have them anymore and have no documentation of them because they were extinct along with the dinosaurs that's why they no longer exist but that's why they are prominent in all cultures like the culture's beliefs or or myths I don't know what I believe. Frankly, it doesn't matter how this got so seeped into culture, although it would be cool to have an answer. It, it's not important. But I do really, really love the idea that dragons are were, were, were pulled originally from dinosaurs, that there's some version of dragons that was real on Earth. Because any any time that I that that something fantastical could be true, isn't that just exciting? Anyway, we don't know. We don't know where the myth of dragons comes from. We don't know what the origin is or how it ended up being everywhere. But it is really cool to theorize and discuss. Now let's talk a little bit about how it kind of has taken over and hasn't died out. There's so many myths that that exist in 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 tons of different cultures that are very isolated or very niche, but dragons everybody knows and are they're they're still so prominent. Even now with modern fantasy novels, with things like D&D and Skyrim, it's 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 still such an, an essential part of our cultures. Not to mention the Chinese dragon that's still obviously extremely prominent. Well, I think part of it is just how imposing and great they are. They, they're this magnificent, fantastical force that I think we just naturally really gravitate towards and naturally think are, are incredible. I think also partially the fact that it is so different across cultures makes it so desirable because the many different forms that a dragon can take, the many different powers a dragon can have, and the many different personalities that a dragon can take on makes it so desirable for a fantastical setting because there's so much that you can do with it while still making it this great powerful force. There's also so much opportunity for subversion of tropes. These these huge beasts can suddenly become these little bitty creatures that that are cute and playful, but still deadly. Uh, you can also make them friendly and lovable. Stuff like the dragon that you went to slay was actually the princess the whole time under a curse, or the dragon is misunderstood and is actually protecting the princess, or whatever. There's so much opportunity for different types of dragons, as well as the standard tropes and subverting of those tropes. There's just so much opportunity for this beast beast that is so powerful and cool. It's a creature that can't seem to die because each generation reads it in classic stories before them and then writes their own versions of it and it just keeps breathing and, and evolving and changing. It's a myth that has endless opportunity and that can constantly be growing and breathing and evolving as literature changes along with it. And it's cool. In fact, I'm a massive lover of dragon fantasy stories and a strong believer that we need more dragon fantasy specifically dragon fantasy where the main characters get to properly interact with the dragon and not it just being some big evil force that needs to be defeated in order for the princess to be saved, the gold to be gotten, the whatever to whatever. But when it's a living, breathing creature that is a part of the makeup of the world, oh, I love it so much. But it is a creature that's origins can't seem to be traced that has existed in the minds of many for as far back as we can trace and that has so, it has so many forms and personalities across the globe. It's one that can change as fantasy changes as well, and it's one that we as people are naturally really drawn to. Even as the genre continues to evolve into new things like D&D, dragons are a driving force in so many ways for things. This has been kind of a difficult video for me to figure out how to condense and comprise into a single short video simply because it's so vague and so vast. But like I said at the beginning of the video, there are a lot of resources down in the description so that you can read more about them and learn more about the many different forms that dragons take. It's really just a creature that fills me with a lot of wonder and awe. And I think that that's a big part of why we constantly continue to come back to it. I'd love to continue discussing this with you in the comments. What are your favorite ways in which dragons have appeared in culture? Uh, 
some of your favorite forms that you've seen dragons take and just chat with me more about it in general. My next video on uh, searching for the origins and seeing how it's changed and progressed over time is going to be vampires, which should be a fun one. I post videos every Tuesday through Friday. I'll see you again soon. Bye.